New York City, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's immortal character, the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes, starring John Stanley. <laughs> this week's story, The Night of Vengeance. Holmes, the heat of these steel furnaces is unbearable. Thousands of degrees in those ovens. You have to bear it, Watson, until we find that murderer. He's hiding somewhere in this foundry, I'll wager. You're right. There he goes, racing past the furnace just ahead. He's climbing that ladder to the catwalk above us. This way, Holmes. Let's go up after him. No, Watson, come back. That cauldron of hot metal over your head, he's turning it over. Look out! Dr. Watson, who wielded the knife of vengeance, and what was he trying to avenge? Those were the awful problems that faced Holmes, Mr. Harris. For this was the killer whose grisly specter prowled the Sheffield area, whose black silhouette stalked in horrible outline against the blinding red glare of the steel furnaces. It began at the home of Theodore Pickering, a partner in the Griswold Pickering Steelworks. Pickering was at home one twilight, uh, relaxing alone in his study. Outside, he heard a wandering tradesman hawking his wares, chanting a familiar sing-song as he rode by. Any knives to be sharpened, mister? Well, I, I don't know. The servants are off today. Surely is something to be sharpened. I've a stone in the cart. It's most inexpensive. Makes doing things about the house so much easier when you've well sharpened knives. Well, I'll look in the kitchen cupboard. Uh, this way. <coughs> what? You've dozens of knives that could use sharpening, sir. I'll fetch my stone. Oh, uh, wait, I... I won't take for the moment. The, I say, uh, how much do you charge? Killing a knife, that's all, sir. Well, uh, I'll roll this stone of my right in here, kitchen. There. There. Here we are. You'll be very happy you've had your knives made sharper. I'll fix them so they'll cut the thinnest paper. If you'll hand me that red knife, sir. Oh, uh, very well. Thank you, sir. <laughs> That's good. I wanted to be sharp as candles. Just watch. How smooth. Watch closely, sir. There's a special reason why I wish you to notice how this blade is sharpened. To appreciate the artistry with which it is done. A uh, special reason? Yes. Why are you so anxious for me to watch closely? You are admiring the sharpening of the knife that will be used to cut your throat. What did you say? This is the knife I will use to kill you, Pickering. To kill me? Are you insane? What sort of a joke is this? How do you know my name? You know mine too. My name is Bennett. Good Lord. You are Bennett. Yes, yes, I, I didn't recognize you. You were stout then. Now your cheeks are hollow, your eyes are sunken, and you've grown a beard. Bennett, where the devil have you come from? What are you up to? I thought I made it very clear. I'm sharpening this knife to cut your throat. Stop that gruesome joking and answer me. I am not joking. You may shout all you like, there's no one about. I made sure of that. I locked the door when I fetched the stones. And though I've suffered years of ill health, I'm still twice as powerful a man as you. Thanks to my years soaking the furnace at the mill. This should be easy for me. Will you stop sharpening that knife? Answer my question. Just a moment longer. I want the knife so sharp. So sharp. <laughs> there we are. Speak up, Bennett. 
Is it your idea of an amusing way to reappear in Sheffield? Oh, not amusing. Simply justice, Dick. Inescapable justice. Late, perhaps. It's been over ten years. Shall I recall certain incidents to your memory? I created an ally process. Discovering a method of manufacturing a new type of steel. The Bennett process. When I offered it to you, the experiment with it was a failure. You and Anne Griswold persuaded me to leave England, to forget my failure. Remember how I disappeared from Sheffield? Uh, of course. I drifted a great deal to the continent, to South Africa, to South America. I degenerated. I began drinking. I was introduced to hashish. I was a degraded wastrel to be found more often than not in the gutters of some godforsaken village of the Near East. Those years had one beneficial effect, though. What do you mean? They changed my appearance radically. One morning, I came across a newspaper article. Look, I have it here. Faded, but still legible. It describes how Pickering and Miss Griswold had become fabulously wealthy in Sheffield with a certain alloy process. You vanished, Bennett. We believed you were dead. I returned here to Sheffield very quietly. Some weeks ago began making inquiries. I found Kennedy, our former assistant. Remember him? Yes. I forced him to confirm my suspicion. You did betray me. You deliberately made that first experiment a failure. Do you want money? We might compute your share. No. No. I want my ten years back. I want the ten years I spent wandering the face of the earth without purpose. And that's impossible. So I'm settling for vengeance. You conniving stink. Let go of my throat, Bunny. Now we'll see if I sharpen the knife well enough. We'll see if it will cut your throat. <laughs> yes, the knife is nice. Tell me, Pickering. Tell me. Painting, was it bought with my money? Was it a dramatic setting for you? Then we must use the knife! I like this! This massive priceless oaken table and the Venetian glass upon it. Did it serve you well here as you sat in my place? Then we must destroy it! These <laughs> And so, if they look splendid, if you receive your guests, the night we must put the night to them. <laughs> Done with your own steel, pickering, your own magnificent shining steel, just the way you and your life pattern should die. By the that made you so glorious and an illicit empire. So, Superintendent Rodney, you say you found Pickering literally butchered. Yes, Mr. Oak. No sign, Superintendent, of the murderer's knife? No sign, Dr. Watson. Not a clue of any sort. That is why I've come running here to Baker Street, Mr. Oak. I opted the train from Sheffield as quick as I could. Oh, of course, I reported the homicide to Scotland Yard. But you know how long they'll be about it. <laughs> An eternity, my dear sir. An eternity. The countryside is in a cold sweat, sir. Why, is this, this madman's liable to go after others with his knife? Yes, you were quite correct in hastening to me, Superintendent. This case is not a matter of weeks, nor of days, nor possibly of hours. The madman must be identified and apprehended instantly. Shall we off to Sheffield, Holmes? We must pack our luggage this minute, Watson, and dash for the railway station. The sheer violence of this crime indicates no ordinary homicide. This is the work of a deranged, malevolent mind. A human being who does not exist by breathing air, but who subsists upon hate in the essence. Distilled venom. Bloodlust. Dr. Watson, we mustn't lose a moment in returning to Mr. Holmes and, and his pursuit of the killer holding the knife of vengeance. 
Well, Mr. Harris, we dash for the train with Superintendent Rodney, and we reach Sheffield. There at the home of the dead man, Mr. Pickering, Holmes began his customary penetrating examination. There, Mr. Holmes. I wouldn't allow him to remove the uh, body for an autopsy till you had a look. Very wise, Superintendent. Must have been a gigantic struggle, Holmes, the way the furniture is upset, the paintings... Very were... little struggle, Watson. A casual examination of the cadaver reveals there are no bruises caused by body blows nor by striking physical objects. Still further examination of the painting, for instance, leads to the conclusion that the painting was slashed by a knife, the same knife, in fact, that butchered Mr. Pickering. How the dickens do you know that, Holmes? My lens shows there are minute specks of blood at the edges where the canvas was ripped. Evidently, after murdering Pickering, the killer went upon an orgy of destruction. Oh, Mr. Holmes, sir, we've, we've still no indication of what this criminal looks like, or who he is, or where he's gone. And if he's as dangerous as you make him out, well, he may be at someone else's throat this very minute. Oh, there's very much to be said about this criminal, Rodney. He's an extremely powerful man with black hair. At the time of committing this bestial deed, he was wearing a dark gray suit. His profession is that of knife sharpening. Holmes, you can't rattle off conclusions that way with a, without explaining them. Hmm. Watson, a gentleman of the late Pickering's means would not sharpen his own knives. You've also learned that it was the servant's night off. But someone did perform that task. Upon the floor to your left, you may perceive traces of emery dust. This is substantiated by the markings of the small wheels of the typical cart employed by professional knife sharpeners. No doubt the killer used the profession as an easy device to gain entry. About his being powerful, though. That uh, oaken table has been turned topsy-turvy. It's so huge and weighty, it requires a man of great strength to upset it. And the upsetting has been done. Certainly not by the dead man, puny chap that he was. You said the killer had black hair and a grey suit. Yes, so I did. That information is to be gathered from beneath the fingernails of the corpse. As he fell, he clutched at the man who was taking his life. But there's a particle of dark grey thread beneath those nails from the murderer's clothes. And a single black hair. A microscopic examination of the medulla, cortex, and cut cut uh, the cuticle of the hair will determine whether it's from the head or the beard. Well, I'll, I'll notify the police of the neighboring villages to be on the alert for a chap of that description. Well, it's not very definite, I must say. I believe we may overcome your skepticism, my dear Rodney, with this extremely small speck of paper I found. Oh, let's see it, huh? Well, it has the appearance of newsprint. Yes, quite. This is a speck that's clearly fallen off a newspaper. It has the peculiarly stiff, yellowish appearance of a faded newspaper of many months ago. There isn't anything on it but that uh, smudge, Holmes. It is of infinite value to us, Watson. Superintendent, if you'll inform me of the location of the nearest telegraph office, in a very short while, I'll supply you with every scrap of information required to trace the killer. Yes, but, but how, Holmes? How? Absurdly simple, Watson. I shall identify and track down the killer by telegraphing Cairo, Egypt. You know, it's been a considerable length of time since you telegraphed to Cairo, Holmes. We've been sitting in this telegraph office for hours here. To whom did you send the message? What did it say? It was a request, Watson, a request with which Cairo will be quick to comply. The police are patrolling the roads for a black-haired, husky knife sharpener, but they may not find him. Aha, uh -huh. this is it. Yes, my name in code. Now, Watson, from that little instrument, we shall have the answer to the riddle. Listen. I still don't understand why you selected Cairo Holmes and what in creation they're telling Quiet, you. Quiet, Watson. You mustn't miss a word. The homicidally inclined gentleman we're searching for may be plunging his knife into another victim, even as we sit here. Yes, I'm glad you've come by. Step in, won't you? Delightful. Mind if I just push my stone into the kitchen this way? There we are, my lady. Aren't you working rather late this evening? Poor man must earn a living. Every chilling extra, you know. My servants are off this evening, but Cook told me that the knives that needed sharpening are in this drawer. Ah, here they are. Thank you. Now, just watch me. 
smooth. Smooth. The edge becomes fine. Very tight. The blade must be keen. So keen. Uh, would you mind to close the door, ma'am? There's a bit of a draft. Certainly. Thank you. Now then, step closer to my wheel, ma'am. Don't be frightened of the spot. You see how the stone caresses the steel. How it strokes away the rough edges. That's it, ma'am. Closer. Closer! <gasps> my arm! Let go, you'll break my arm! What are you... I want to be very sure you stay right here, Anne. If you don't let go of my arm, I... I'm not just an everyday power. <gasps> Not the garden variety of intruder after a lovely woman. Not by any means. Pickering didn't recognize me either. You're Bennett! Yes. I was at Pickering's earlier. He oh. died by stealing. I promised myself that you and Grizzle would die that way too. No, no. I know you coaxed me into the experiment with the alloy. You schemed with Pickering. You used my attraction to you as a lover no. so that you both might learn the process. Oh, no. Then when it seemed to be a failure, you persuaded me to leave England so the two of you might revel in the profit. Oh, no, no. I'm going to cut your throat with this steel. No, no. It no. is painful, but not so long. Pickering died quickly. It's just one neat stroke like this. <laughs> Easy, Watson. That's Bennett. Turn blazes to you. My name is Sherlock Holmes, Bennett. I'm a criminal investigator. Keep away from me. I'm very handy with this knife. So we've observed. Careful, Watson. Well, I'll just borrow this chair, Anne, and clear my way through this window. Oh, he's gone through the window. Watson, Watson, come on. See him out there? Oh, confounded, Holmes. It's so blasted dark out there. And never mind playing cat and mouse with him. I know where he'll go. Where? He knows the town's onto him. Therefore, he'll hide. And where would he hide? The one place that's most familiar to him. By the huge fires and the bubbling cauldrons of the steel foundry. Run, Watson, run! The heat by these steel furnaces is unbearable, Holmes. Thousands of degrees in those ovens. We'll have to bear it, Watson, until we find Mr. Bennett. He's somewhere in this foundry, I'll wager. You're right, I see him. There he goes, racing past the furnace. Way down the other end there. Yes. He's climbing a ladder to the catwalk above this, us. This way, Holmes. Let's go up after it. Oh, oh, there you are, Mr. Holmes. Rodney, are you armed as I suggested? Yes. Well, there's Bennett, high on the catwalk. See him? Walking gingerly like a human fly along the girders. Yes, yes, I see him. Come down from there, Bennett. I'm warning you. If you don't come down, I'll shoot. I'll never come down. I'm waiting. I'll try to win. Look, he's staggering. He's falling. He's going to fall into that cauldron of hot metal. You know, Holmes, I do not intend to leave this railway station and board the train for London. In fact, I do not intend to budge from here until you explain why you telegraphed Cairo. <laughs> and I'd better explain, Watson, since I shall desire the pleasure of your company on the return journey. The speck of newspaper was not entirely blank, Watson. Oh, there was a smudge on it, yes. Hardly a smudge. The slight marking on it was a Coptic G. Uh, the Coptic G? The Copts, my dear Watson, are an ancient minority of Muslim Egypt. They have a singular language. And it's a fascinating fact of contemporary journalism that just one, one newspaper on earth publishes a considerable number of items in Coptic as well as in English. It's a newspaper in Cairo. All that was on the paper we found was the letter G in Coptic. So one could then deduce that the crucial clipping must have come from a newspaper in Cairo. I see. I telegraphed a request to repeat the exact wording of any account they'd published recently concerning the pickering Griswold steelwork. Oh, I see, Holmes. They telegraphed the contents of the clipping, which must have uh, mentioned Bennett, eh? Yes, yes. It was a story about the brilliant success of the steelworks based upon the Bennett process. That made Bennett, the sole missing member of the triangle, our most likely culprit. The fact that he'd done away with pickering made it clear that he would then be after Anne Griswold, which is why we hurried to her home. Astonishing, Holmes. Astonishing. How you maneuver these men to their doom. Watson, 
when a man crosses the border of morality into the alien wasteland of time. No matter where he roams, he has an inevitable rendezvous at 221B Baker Street. <laughs> Well, Dr. Watson, the shocking adventure of the knife of vengeance was certainly cause for admiring Mr. Holmes' resourcefulness. The world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Our stories are based upon the character Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and the program is produced and directed by Basil Lockwood. Sherlock Holmes is played by John Stanley. Dr. Watson by George Spelter. The part of Bennett was played by Ted Osborne. This week's story was written by Howard Merrill with special music by Albert Berman. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in The Adventure of the Fabulous Celebrity. Harris speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.